In his legendary play King Lear, William Shakespeare used false letters as a dramatic device to reveal the character's loyalty or betrayal. For example, Gloucester's son Edmund wrote one to set up Edgar, his older brother. The letter, that appeared to be signed by Edgar, suggested that the brothers conspired to the throne and kill their father. Unfortunately, the evil plan worked, and Gloucester condemned the innocent son, who had no knowledge of the false letter. Today, we're going to talk about Man in the Middle attack, which can be used to forge center identity and intercept encrypted messages. This is Ron Matino. It is no surprise that Edmund's methods successfully survived through centuries. Fake news, fake identities, fake letters and even fake videos these days can be utilized as a way of tricking people into doing what you want or simply setting them up. But it should be next to impossible to forge someone's identity with all the encryption and digital signature technologies we have today. Or, at least, that's what you think. Enter Man in the Middle attack. The Man in the Middle comes in several versions. Let us first consider the simplest one. Say Boris and Linda are up to exchanging messages over the internet. Imagine this happens some 25 years ago, and they use Internet Relay Chat, a text messenger popular at that time. While these days IRC uses encryption, back in the day, messages were transmitted as plain text, using a simple TCP IP connection. What that means exactly is that by intercepting and examining TCP packets, a hacker could easily view the entire chat session, maybe after sorting through some extra service data. If you have to ask me how a hacker could intercept someone's data, that's actually plain easy. Everyone uses Wi-Fi these days, right? The reason we do is mostly because mobile data is much more expensive in most countries. So once you're home or at your office desk, your phone automatically logs onto your local Wi-Fi router and gets internet access. But how would you react if instead of connecting automatically, your phone popped up a connection wizard asking you to choose which network to connect to? If their default network would be present on the list, most people wouldn't be alarmed. Tell you more. Many people wouldn't give a damn if the network name was different. They would just pick the one that worked and move on with their daily tasks. So what happened to the router? Not much. In fact, you never connected to it. Instead, your phone logged onto a Wi-Fi hotspot emulator, a piece of software a hacker ran on their laptop to relay your internet connection. All they had to do to pull that off is be in your Wi-Fi range. Bam! Your chat is now compromised. And the software that allows data packet inspection runs in the middle between you and your real internet service provider. Such attacks are even more likely in public places like cafes or shopping centers where the legitimate Wi-Fi network name can be easily spoofed by the hacker. As we can see, everything I type in the chat window gets mirrored in packet inspection tool and can be observed by the third party. This particular application I'm running right now is called Network Monitor 3.4 and is available for download from Microsoft's website. It, however, runs locally on my computer without actually hacking into anybody's system and shows TCP packets that pass through my default network interface, which is basically the Ethernet cable that's plugged into my computer. The Wi-Fi hotspot emulators used by hackers are pretty much similar. Only they intercept data passed through the wireless network by relaying it, so you get the idea. Looks like it doesn't take a genius to intercept data transmitted in plain text format. So, once that became obvious, at some point network gurus came up with a way to protect users from their information being so easily stolen. At present, all instant messengers, including WhatsApp, Telegram, FaceTime, and even ICQ, Use the so-called point-to-point encryption. Let us see how that works. Once again, Boris and Linda launch messenger applications on their smartphones. Once they do, each of their devices generates a pair of keys. A public key and a private key. A public key is used to encrypt data, while the private key 
is utilized to decrypt it. It's important to note that the public and private keys are generated together and comprise a matched pair. Once a message is encrypted with a certain public key, it can only be decrypted with the corresponding private key that was generated along with it and is matched to it. If you ask me how exactly those keys look, they are just a chunk of numbers generated with the help of a somewhat tricky mathematical formula, like WhatsApp uses 256-bit keys, which is equal to 32 bytes. So what is the purpose of these keys? And how will Boris and Linda use them to create a secure chat session? Well, the first thing they need to do is exchange their public keys. Now Boris has Linda's public key and Linda has Boris's public key, while they keep their private keys to themselves. Imagine Boris wants to message Linda. What his phone does now is encrypt message text using Linda's public key and send it over. As the message reaches Linda's phone, it is automatically decrypted with Linda's private key, which is, remember, matched to the public key that she previously shared with Boris. If Linda wants to message Boris, her phone will encrypt the message with his public key. When the message reaches Boris's phone, it will be decrypted using Boris's private key that is matched to the public key he had previously shared with Linda. This method achieves two goals. First, no one can intercept the conversation anymore. Actually, no one can even know for sure if this chunk of data is in fact an encrypted message, so it's impossible to tell whether Boris and Linda chatted at all. Just like these characters, which are by the way called a hex dump in programming, make no sense to you, they also make no sense to anybody, including the IT people and software they may run in an attempt to analyze it. Second, because the public and private key, like I said, are a matched pair, whenever information is decrypted, the party who receives it may know for sure that it originated from a trusted source. If it were encrypted with the wrong key or modified during transmission, the decryption procedure would have reported an error because the checksum, which is a kind of an integrity check in programming, would not match. What's also important is that a new pair of keys is generated on each endpoint before every new chat, in case the old ones somehow get leaked or compromised. Now, that seems like a perfect way to exchange information securely. Even if the hackers manage to intercept data packets that travel between Boris and Linda, they would naturally not be able to access or modify information because data is encrypted on the sending endpoint and run through an integrity check on receipt. Or would they? Consider our previous example. Linda wants to communicate with Boris using end-to-end -end encryption, but her Wi-Fi router over which communication takes place has been compromised. As usual, Linda's phone generates a pair of keys and sends the public key to Boris. Mind you, that takes place before the encrypted channel has been established between the two parties. As you may guess, the authentic Linda's key never actually makes it to Boris's device, because it gets intercepted by the hacker. Once the hacker obtains Linda's public key, he stores it for future use and generates a new pair of keys compatible with the messenger application in question, the one that Boris and Linda use. What he does next is send the fake key to Boris. Boris's phone thinks it came from Linda and uses it to encrypt messages that Boris sends to Linda. As the hacker has the matching private key to that, he can now intercept everything Boris sends to Linda. At this point, the hacker can do anything. He can re-encrypt the message with Linda's original public key, he also has it, remember, and send it over to Linda so that she doesn't get suspicious. Or he can modify Boris's message and send it over to Linda. Or he can write up a completely new message that Boris never posted, encrypt it with Linda's public key that he intercepted and send it over to unsuspecting Linda. What I have just described 
is yet another case of man in the middle attack. And it's obviously not done manually, because public key exchange is performed very fast and is transparent to the user. Instead, the hacker uses software that he had written or somehow obtained from his fellow hackers or the darknet. As usual, I'm going to give you a couple of tips you can follow to keep your conversations private. If your device has sensitive data or your conversation is clandestine, do not use Wi-Fi at all, especially in public places. In rare cases, the man-in-the-middle attack can also be carried out over the mobile data. However, for that to happen, your service provider must be in on it, which is only possible if you are being officially investigated by a law enforcement agency or if the provider has been hacked, which is highly unlikely. If you are trying to stay private, do not use messengers that everyone uses. Due to their popularity, the darknet will probably offer more tools to hack them. Also, with most internet-based messengers, texting is safer than talking, because chat sessions usually go through the server and do not expose your IP, whereas voice conversations may use a direct TCP connection, which means your IP will be released to the other party. As we know already, geo-tracking by IP can be frighteningly accurate. You can check out my other video on that, the link is in the description. Also, keep in mind that attackers will always go after low-hanging fruit. That is, if you're vigilant and it's too much work for them, they'll probably go looking for another victim. That was Ron Martino. If you found this video useful, please support this channel by writing a comment below and give me a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to share this video on social media and, of course, hit the subscribe button. See you next week.